Well, hey guys, happy Friday. For the Q&A today, I'm gonna talk all about melanoma. This was highly requested after my basal cell carcinoma video. Um, so check that video out if you want more information on really the probably some of the most important stuff you should know about your skin. Uh, far more important than any product review I could ever give you guys. Uh, but anyways, melanoma, what is it? It is a deadly skin cancer that occurs in cells in the skin called melanocytes. Melanocytes are the cells in our skin that make pigment, that make color in the skin. And they can uh, acquire mutations throughout our lifetime that result in uncontrolled growth and subsequent formation of this cancer called melanoma. And it is not as common as other types of skin cancer like basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, but it's, co it's fairly common and its incidence, meaning the number of new cases, is actually increasing uh, from years prior. It can occur at any age in adulthood. It's pretty rare though in children, although it can occur in children as well. Um, but importantly, people can die from melanoma. It is a skin cancer that, unlike basal cell carcinoma, for example, uh, which tends to stay in the skin, melanoma can spread outside of the skin and metastasize throughout the body and is a very deadly disease, if, particularly if it's not caught early. Um, so I'll get into that in today's video. Um, but in, in the U.S. alone, in 2019, it's estimated that we're going to see 96,480 new cases of melanoma in the U.S. alone. Also, 7,230 people will die of melanoma in the year of 2019 in the United States. Risk factors for getting a melanoma are your age. Melanoma is more common in people over the age of 65. If you've had a melanoma in the past, your chances of having another melanoma are greater, so having a prior melanoma puts you at an increased risk for getting another one. Um, also, if you've had any other prior skin cancers, basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, that too is a risk factor for melanoma. If you have a lot of moles, for reasons we don't fully understand, that seems to be a risk factor for melanoma as well. And if you have multiple moles that are what, what are deemed atypical, atypical melanocytic nevi is their, is their medical name, if you have more than five of those, that is a risk factor. If you have a strong family history of melanoma, you're also at increased risk. Melanoma is more common in people with really fair skin that burns easily. While melanoma is more common in, in Caucasian skin types, it can and does occur in darker skin types. Melanoma is more common in men than women. However, uh, melanomas diagnosed before the age of 50 are actually more common in women than men. Melanoma is 20 times more common in whites than it is in blacks, but it can occur in both in, in blacks as well. The lifetime risk of getting a melanoma is 2.6% for, for whites, for Caucasian people. That means that one in 38 Caucasian uh, persons will develop a melanoma. It's 0.1% for blacks, so one in a thousand uh, black people will develop melanoma. And it's 0.6% for Hispanics, uh, so one in 167 Hispanics will develop melanoma. While there are a lot of different risk factors for melanoma, we don't fully understand how all these risk factors come together to put you at risk. Having a lot of moles, for example, is a risk factor for melanoma, but moles don't always turn into melanoma, and not all melanomas come from moles. Um, so how, that, how the two are tied together, we're really not entirely clear. Um, but we do know that melanoma is a result of mutations in the DNA of the melanocytes, and those are mutations that largely are acquired through your lifetime. They're acquired from exposure to ultraviolet radiation from the sun um, or from a tanning bed. Using a tanning bed is a risk factor for melanoma. It significantly increases your risk for melanoma. Um, and the most common mutation to, that you can acquire that is in, found in melanoma is something called a BRAF mutation. BRAF is what is called an oncogene. While ultraviolet radiation seems to play a role in many types of melanomas, it seems to have no role in other types of melanomas because you can get melanoma on body sites that are rarely, if ever, exposed to the sun, like the soles of the feet, for example. 
And less commonly, you can have an inherited gene mutation that puts you at risk for melanoma. So melanoma can arise on totally normal appearing skin, but it also can occur within a skin lesion. It can arise within a completely normal looking mole uh, that's called a benign melanocytic nevus, or it can occur within a funny looking mole, which is called an atypical melanocytic nevus or a dysplastic nevus. These are nevi that are large and they just look a little funny. And remember what I said as a risk factor uh, for melanoma is if you have five or more of these atypical funny looking moles. Uh, then there's an atypical looking solar lentigo, which is a sunspot that you can get on sun exposed areas, it tends to appear in older adults, and a really funny looking sunspot is, yeah, sometimes melanoma can arise in those. And then a large size congenital nevus, uh, melanoma can sometimes arise in those as well. Melanoma can occur anywhere on the body. It doesn't just occur on sun exposed sites. It can also occur in your mouth, in your genitals, in the vaginal area. It can occur in your eyes, your nose, and your nail beds. Um, and the first sign is usually an odd looking freckle or mole that looks different, has a variety of different colors to it, or sometimes it can just be a bump that has no color. That's called an amelanotic melanoma or melanoma that has no color to it. Um, there can be some areas within the spot that look like a scar. So you can see uh, it, it can take on a few different forms. Some melanomas start out as flat because the melanoma cells, the tumor cells, grow out into the skin before they grow down. Um, whereas other melanoma types grow down very quickly and they present more as a raised bump. The things that you should look for though, in terms of checking your skin, are a variety of features that fall under the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E. A stands for asymmetry. Any new or changing lesion that is asymmetric is suspicious. Meaning if you draw a line through it, it will look different on either side. The second B is for borders. Irregular borders is another suspicious feature. Color variation is C. Uh, so a lot of different colors within the, the lesion, black, blue, brown, tan, white, uh, all within one lesion, that is suspicious. And then the size, diameter, that's the D, diameter greater than six millimeters is suspicious. And then the E stands for evolving, which really just means this is changing, it looks different than it did a few months ago and different in a weird way or you know, it's, it's now becoming itchy or tender. It's evolving into something else. So that's your E. So those are things that you should be aware of when you're examining your own skin. Checking your own skin is really an important part of surveying for suspicious lesions, particularly if you have some of the risk factors that I mentioned, such as a strong family history or multiple atypical nevi. Uh, doing self-skin exams is, a, is an important step in identifying melanomas. That's important because if caught early, they can be treated and cured. Um, whereas if they are left undiagnosed, the likelihood of them growing deeper and causing uh, metastatic disease is greater. So there are a lot of different subtypes of melanoma and they're classified based on things like where they're located, what they look like, some of the mutations that they contain and how, how, they, how they are thought to then go on to evolve. The first type is called superficial spreading melanoma. This is a flat, irregular looking lesion that most often occurs in areas of intense intermittent sun exposure. For example, very common in men on the trunk, on the chest and on the back. So, you know, men don't go around their whole lives with their shirts off, but they do spend intermittent periods of time in the sun with their shirts off. So that is where they occur. And in women, it's their lower legs. So that's a site of more intermittent sun exposure. You wear shorts sometimes during the year, not all year. Um, and you know, you get more UV exposure on the legs intermittently throughout the year. They're large and 25% arise within an existing mole. So these are more likely to come up in a, in a mole, that you, an otherwise normal appearing mole. And it's thought that ultraviolet radiation exposure in those areas suppresses some of the immune system's ability to clear out the abnormal melanocytes. 
The second type of melanoma that I'll talk about is lentigo maligna. This is a melanoma that occurs exclusively in sun damaged skin. It's more common in older adults and it's going to be more, most common on the head and neck area because those are the sites of more continuous sun exposure. Um, and the risk is most closely tied to the degree of sun damage that you have. And it's going to be more common in people who have spent their life working outdoors, so outdoor workers. This type of skin cancer is more common in men than women. The third type of melanoma is one that is less common. It's called acral lentiginous melanoma. It's a long name, but this is a type of melanoma that occurs on the palms of the hands and the soles, as well as in the nail beds. This is the, one of the least common types of melanoma, uh, both in whites and in blacks. It is pretty uncommon, but of the melanomas that black people get, this is the most common one and the most likely one a person of color is to get. And it has nothing to do with ultraviolet radiation. Um, and it can appear as a black spot on your palm or sole that's changing. And then it also can appear in the nail beds as uh, starting out as a streak, but turn into a thicker, dark discoloration, a bump in the nail. Yeah, things in the nail definitely bring to the attention of your dermatologist. We, a lot of people don't realize we spend a lot of time and training and we have a lot of knowledge based on the treatment of the nail. I mean, that is our territory, treatment of the nail on the nail bed. And there are a lot of tumors besides melanoma that occur in the nail. There, you know, you can get warts and a variety of other things there. So pay attention to your nails. If something funny comes up, uh, bring it to their attention. Uh, and, you know, it could be a melanoma in, in very rare cases. Then the last type that I'll talk about is called nodular melanoma. This is a type of melanoma that tends to grow downward more so than outward. So it presents as a large bump. And this is a type of melanoma that all, a lot of times does not meet the criteria of the ABCDEs, meaning it looks just like a smooth, symmetric, uh, uniform bump sometimes. And some of its symptoms may be discomfort, um, pain, tingling, and it can arise uh, pretty much at any site, but the head and neck is more common. How are, the, how are melanomas diagnosed? You play an important role in the diagnosis of melanoma, you and your spouse. It's actually shown that people who are married um, get their melanomas diagnosed earlier because they have a spouse looking out for them. So doing self-skin exams, particularly if you have multiple risk factors for melanoma, is really important. It's recommended that you do these once a month in a well-lit area. You just get, get completely naked, you get a handheld mirror, or your partner can help you as well. And look at all surfaces of the body and look for anything that's new or changing or suspicious. Also really important to look in the general area. Um, you know, it, you, you won't know it's there unless you look. <laughs> um, so look there and anything that comes up new, you definitely bring it to the attention of your, your healthcare provider. People who have multiple risk factors are also advised to have routine skin exams. And some people who have a lot of moles are even advised to undergo something called mole mapping, where we photograph all of your moles and kind of do this total body photography. That way we have a, an account of your moles that we can then follow with time. Uh, that, is, that is a really good way to keep track of multiple moles. Um, then if a suspicious lesion occurs, the dermatologist is going to take a biopsy of it. A biopsy is a skin sample that can be done either by shaving the area off or by punching it out or by cutting it out. Um, and the type of biopsy is going to be guided by the type of melanoma, the location and the size. But the idea is to get the largest sample possible and we send it to the pathologist to look at it under the microscope. And sometimes we do a lot of other tests on the, on the sample, something called immunohistochemistry, fluorescence in situ hybridization, comparative genomic hybridization, and also uh, gene expression profiling can all be done to characterize the lesion. And all that information can be put together to come up with a consensus about if it is something that is truly a melanoma or not. Sometimes you might also be advised to have what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. That's going to be based on some features in your initial skin biopsy. You may actually have to have a biopsy of the lymph node that drains the surrounding skin to make sure there is no suspicion. The treatment for melanoma is going to be influenced by the stage of the melanoma, so how advanced it is, 
and location. But melanomas are treated with what's called wide local excision, meaning they are cut out and as much of it is cut out as possible and uh, sent to the pathologist to ensure that the margins, meaning the surrounding skin, is negative of tumor. And also, in some cases, you may actually have to have a lymph node dissection, uh, which can be very involved. So meaning the lymph nodes that drain the area may have to be removed as well. Um, so, you know, that, that happens when melanomas are more advanced, that you have to have that. Once the melanoma has metastasized, meaning spread to other organs, the prognosis is grim, and there are more involved treatments that, that can be pursued. One is immunotherapy, which is, involves giving medications that look like infl inflammatory mediators of our immune system to kind of get our immune system revved up and go after the tumor. Another one that's newer, uh, well, wasn't available when I started medical school, um, and we, we've now got, and is, is a really novel treatment, is a drug or a class of drugs that target that BRAF mutation I mentioned that is most common in melanoma. Uh, I've got one called debrafenib and another called bemurafenib, for example. Um, and then depending on, some, some melanomas may respond to a medication that inhibits another gene called CKIT, um, and that is called imatinib. Another drug is called ipilimumab. Uh, this is a drug that gets your immune system to attack the melanoma as well. We have a newer class of medications called check, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the way these work is they kind of get at some of the coy ways that melanoma can distract your immune system. One of the ways is that it can express something on its surface called PD-1 ligand. And what that does is it binds to the surface of recept surface receptors on some cells in your immune system and kind of tells them to go away, basically. Um, so we have drugs now that go in and interfere with that, that, little, that little deviance, and that can really help uh, extend patients' lifespan as well. We've got a lot of new novel drugs and treatments for this disease, but it is deadly. Um, people do die from it, and the incidence is quite is increasing. What is the outlook for melanoma? Melanoma that is caught early and is what is called in situ, meaning just within just within the skin, it hasn't spread deeper down, that actually has a very good prognosis and is cured by, by cutting it out. Uh, the risk of developing a metastatic melanoma or more involved mel melanoma is increased the longer the delay is uh, between appearance of the atypical spot and diagnosis. So if anything comes up on your skin, get it checked out sooner rather than later. That's really important. After melanoma has been diagnosed and treated, you have a lot more follow-up that needs to occur. You have to have regular skin checks from your dermatologist. They're going to examine the surgical site where the melanoma was cut out, make sure there's no evidence that it's come back, and they're going to examine your lymph nodes. Depending on the type of melanoma that you have, they may order a blood test to, to check for certain markers. And honestly, if you're a patient, that can be really traumatic to go through. After you've gone through the, the pain and trauma and fear of dealing with a melanoma diagnosis and treatment, after it's gone, every time you have to go in for a skin check, that could be really scary, like, oh my God, what if they find it? So definitely reach out to your family members and uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for emotional support, see a counselor. Don't underestimate how traumatic that can be. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really not a pleasant experience. A total body skin exam is you feel very vulnerable, and knowing that they're looking for cancer, I think it'd be one of the one of the scariest things for patients. And it often is something that we forget about because it's like, oh, I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, like, why? You know, people kind of move on after that. But really, that part is almost just as scary. So, um, yeah. But anyways, guys, I hope this video was helpful to you. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.